if people only knew the absurd assumptions that underlie these models, at the end of the 1960s, Amos Tversky, who was an economist with an interest in psychology, met Daniel Kahneman, who was an academic psychologist, and over coffee one day, he told Daniel Kahneman how economists model human behavior and the way that people develop feelings of well-being. And Daniel Kahneman literally didn't believe it. He sputtered his coffee out. He laughed. He thought it was absurd. And they got together and decided to do something about it. This is the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley, and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. If this is your first time hearing about MMT, you might want to listen to our first three episodes for an introduction, which I've linked to in the show notes, along with some other things that relate to this particular episode. And as ever, I've linked to where you can support this podcast financially via patreon.com slash MMT podcast. Support starts at a dollar a month or a pound a month or whatever the equivalent is wherever you live. We're 100% listener funded. Your financial support really helps keep the show going and your support in other ways, whether it's by recommending us to other people or just by listening and spreading the word about this stuff really helps too. A big thank you to all of our supporters so far and thanks as ever for the time you put into understanding MMT. Let's dive in. Welcome one and all to the MMT podcast. I'm Christian Riley. And I'm Patricia Pino. And we are delighted to be joined today by our friend, economist, author and founder of Modern Money Lab, Professor Stephen Hale. Thanks for joining us today, Stephen. Well, thank you both for having me on again. So long time listeners to this show will know that currency issuing governments spend new money into existence when they spend. They're not revenue constrained, they're resource constrained. And so for governments like ours, uh, like the Australian government or the UK government, and many more, we say anything that's technically feasible is financially affordable. And so often the next question becomes, why aren't governments using this position to do something to say end poverty or fully fund the national health service or tackle climate change? Because there's popular support for these things and they're technically feasible, but it's often said some of these more progressive aspirations are politically impossible. So everybody wants these things, but there's this outside entity called politics that comes in, ruins everything. So I think all of this gets us into policy framing, which gets us to behavioral economics. And Stephen, in your book, Economics for Sustainable Prosperity, you have a chapter on behavioral economics. And early on, there's a subheading, people as they are not. And I think that gets to the heart of many of our issues with the way mainstream economics models human beings. So tell us about people as they are not. Yes, well, neoclassical economics has at its far representative individual. They often talk about a representative household as though an individual and a household are the same thing. That representative individual has godlike knowledge about the economy. They understand how the economy works. It turns out in their models, the economy works the way neoclassical economists think it works. And the people in the models understand that. They have what the post-Keynesian economist Paul Davison calls actuarial certainty. What that means is that whenever they're making decisions, they're able to judge the impact of those decisions on their well-being right the way across their future lives. Not absolutely for certain, but they can estimate and on average get this right, expected values, expected outcomes for anything that's important to them, and they can form statistical probability distributions. They are self-centered. They consistently make decisions in their own self-interest. They understand what their self-interests are. They have consistent preferences for the types of things that they like to do, the goods they like to consume between work and leisure as far as risk is concerned. They're able to make their own decisions about how many hours a week they work, when they work, when they have leisure time, work is a bad thing. 
in these models. Leisure is a good thing. They give up some of their good leisure and do some work they hate doing so that they can consume more goods now and uh, in the future they are able to make optimal decisions about whether they should save now in order to be able to spend more in the future or whether it would be worth borrowing more but borrowing today in order to consume more today and pay back the loan in the future and they never make any avoidable mistakes this is called rational expectations in neoclassical economics the assumption is that although sometimes their forecasts won't be what actually happens because there'll be some random event, some shock that they couldn't have allowed for in advance, which they then rapidly and rationally adjust to. They never do anything foolish. They're never misled. They never take out loans they're unlikely to ever be able to repay. They never engage foolishly. It kind of discounts the whole advertising industry in a way. I think I'm channeling Noam Chomsky here, but, you know, it's like in these models, you've got a utility maximizing person who's acting very rationally, but the whole advertising industry is set up to make people make irrational decisions and uninformed decisions. Or to exploit the emotional side of people, right? Yeah. Well, the the original justification for advertising in neoclassical economics was that it was supposed to be providing valuable information to allow people to make even better informed decisions, although I thought they were supposed to be well informed in the first place. But then when people, some of them anyway, reluctantly accepted that this wasn't a purpose of a lot of advertising in that lots of advertising, TV adverts, for example, don't seem to convey any information at all, really, about the characteristics or the quality of the product. They then moved on to more absurd justifications, one of which was that in a world of imperfect information, If you waste more money on advertising your product, it's a signal to customers that the product genuinely does have a good quality. Otherwise, you wouldn't be spending the money on the advertising. I couldn't tell you the author, but there's been at least one paper that said that justification for advertising spending. And another absurd justification was that actually the advertising is part of the product as far as we consumers are concerned. We enjoy consuming a good or service because in part of the advertising, which is part of the broader experience of being a consumer. It's all nonsense. So this rational expectations replace something called adaptive expectations, which was basically the statement that individuals make decisions based entirely on what happened in the past. And I think mainstream economists justified the rational expectations as saying, okay, yeah, it may not be realistic, but it's certainly more realistic than the adaptive expectations model. Do you have anything to say about that? Well, the problem is, of course, it's even less realistic than the adaptive expectations model. In my book, and when talking about neoclassical economics, from a, not just in this way, for a variety of reasons, I borrowed some terms from a neuroscientist called Paul Glimpscher, where I talked about neoclassical economics as soft economics. That was his term, which, the way I used the term, it meant basically unrealistic, divorced from reality and actually not the people that do it, not caring all that much that what they were doing was divorced from reality. But the move to rational expectations, rational expectations was originally an idea that was developed in the early 1960s in microeconomics. But what was important was when it got imported into macroeconomics in the early 1970s. And I saw that as a transition from soft economics to super soft economics, from something which was unrealistic and biased and just supported the status quo or even argued for a move back to a pre-Keynesian, even less equitable society. In Milton Friedman's work in the 60s, there's adaptive expectations that, in his view, if you tried to manage the economy to push unemployment down, you could only do that by fooling people about their real value of what they were being offered to give up their leisure time and take work. But gradually, they'd adapt their expectations to reality over time. You wouldn't be able to fool them permanently. Well, we get to the 1970s, and we had another Nobel Prize winner, Robert Lucas, who incorporated rational expectations into macroeconomics and developed what became known as new classical economics, which replaced Friedman's monetarism. And in Lucas's view of the world, it was basically Milton Friedman, but with the idea that if you announced what you were going to do, if you told 
people in the general public that you were going to try and force unemployment down, well, they understand the economy and they would be able to forecast that what you were going to do was going to drive up the cost of living and push down their real wages. So you wouldn't be able to persuade them to take jobs anyway. Consequently, unemployment wouldn't fall at all and all you'd do is push inflation up immediately so that macroeconomic policy, as far as output and employment is concerned in Lucas's model, becomes neutral. Nothing which is announced can have any effect on the economy. And that dominated macroeconomics for about 15 years. During the Thatcher era, I mean, you know, what Thatcher did, well, her advisors didn't expect what happened, the austerity of the early 80s, which, of course, trebled the unemployment rate in the UK and had devastating social consequences that remained well, with you in the UK, with us, because I was there at the time for, for decades. They didn't expect that to happen at all. They thought, oh, we'll announce we're going to tighten up on inflation and firms will stop putting their prices up, workers will stop asking for higher wages and we'll just get inflation down and there won't be any major impact on the economy. That's the macroeconomic analysis that went into the first Thatcher government. Of course, it was so disastrous, not only in the UK, but also elsewhere. And it was so obvious that Ronald Reagan, who talked about that, but then completely ignored it, really, when he was the president, was producing better outcomes in the US economy than in places like the UK, that by the end of the 1980s, it was dead, the rational expectations revolution in its original form was over, but they didn't. It's such a beautiful thing to put into a mathematical model. So the term rational expectations didn't quite disappear from economics. Instead, they found ways to keep it in the models, but to still have the potential for unemployment to rise during a recession or for macroeconomic policy to have at least a short-term impact on unemployment. They got back to the sort of 1960s pre-rational expectation results without getting rid of rational expectations, but they did that by introducing other ridiculous things into their models. The most ridiculous thing of all was something called, which came in the 80s into macro modelling, which Patricia might be familiar with, called the Calvo pricing rule. And the Calvo pricing rule was the idea that, and I've never really seen anybody discuss how absurd it is in neoclassical macroeconomics. They just sort of assume it. The Calvo pricing rule. It's a sticky price. Yeah, that's a sticky price. But the idea is, when you look at the story, the story is that there's supposed to be a lottery in every period of time. And firms that win the lottery are allowed to change their prices. And firms that don't win the lottery aren't. And literally, that's built into new Keynesian macroeconomics, which is still dominant today. Right. <laughs> uh, if people only knew the absurd assumptions that underlie these models, that to be fair, most of the economists using the models, they've sort of forgotten about. Right. So when we're studying this at Modern Money Lab, this subject area, you get the students to look at a psychologist called Gerd Gigerenza. And he tells this joke about a professor from Columbia University who gets a job offer from another university and he can't decide whether or not to take the job. And he's talking to his colleague about the problem. Which job shall I take? Shall I go? Shall I stay? And his colleague says, look, what's the problem? You've got your options. You've written books about this. Just maximize your expected utility. And the professor gets exasperated and says, Come on, this is serious. Yeah, and the whole crowd laughs. That's the only <laughs> minute of a video by somebody else that I play in the whole course because I like it so much. It's so funny. It gets a good laugh. Gigarenza is very interesting, yeah. The thing is, I wouldn't mind that going back to the rational expectations, I don't mind them saying, oh, this is just an approximation. It's not meant to be realistic. But I do resent that Lucas critique thing about agents already know the effect of the policy you're going to do. So the policy itself is useless as a result of that, because it's so self-referential. It basically says there's something very arrogant about saying the economy works this way. And also everybody already knows the economy works this way. And in order to work that way, everybody needs to already know that it works that way. And it just doesn't make any sense to me. And I really don't know how it's defended in any level. 
Uh, well, I could say a couple of things about Robert Lucas. I think he passed on recently, so I'm not going to be sued. Oh, really? oh okay. He was not bad as a mathematician, I suppose, but he knew nothing about money and banking and about real people. And he wrote papers saying that uh, insights from psychology was irrelevant and that he really wasn't interested in neuroscience and neuroeconomics and how the human brain worked because that didn't matter either. He was remarkably resistant to significantly changing his mind over time, although I suppose he played a role in various generations of neoclassical macroeconomics that he was part of. It's not worth explaining to the people in the podcast, but real business cycle theory and so-called endogenous growth theory that Gordon Brown absurdly once referred to in a speech I seem to remember in the early 2000s. But what gave me the greatest satisfaction about Robert Lucas was that he got divorced. And in his divorce, no, that wasn't what gave me satisfaction. (laughs) In his divorce settlement, I think his wife had a right to 50% of his earnings for the next 10 years, if I remember rightly. Oh, my God. And he won the Nobel Prize nine years later. (laughs) You get a lot of money when you win the Nobel Prize. That gave me great satisfaction that if he was going to win, he didn't win it the following year. (laughs) How much is that? Is that a million or more? Oh, I couldn't tell you, but I know it's a large amount. I'm unlikely to win the Nobel Prize for (laughs) economics, so I can't say that I've looked into it. But, yes, it would be a very significant sum of money. What about how people are rather than how people are not? Let's get the people to the model. (laughs) Yeah, well, Paul Davidson, the famous post-Keynesian economist, wrote a number of papers down the years basically saying the same thing, which is that rational expectations is not even possible. It's not just that it's unrealistic. It's not that it's an approximation. It's a description of something which is not possible on our planet, in our economy. Our economy is a complex and uncertain system, and it's impossible for some of the most important decisions we have to make in life, even to form probability distributions that have any meaning about the future. Nobody understands how the economy works. The economists don't agree on how the economy works. And even if there are only two points of view on how the economy works, governing our behavior, the interaction of group two, just as few as two groups making decisions over time would create a complex system with feedback effects, and that's the world that actually exists. It's far, far different to the remarkably simplistic model that Lucas and Sargent and other new classical economists, building on the work of people like Friedman from the previous generation, and which was then built on again by the Paul Krugmans and the Larry Summers and the Greg Mancus in the 1990s, and 2000s, we're still trying to get over now. This is really what I wanted to get into, this situation that we run into in the real world called fundamental uncertainty. It's called Knightian uncertainty in some contexts. I've also seen it called radical uncertainty. Can you tell us about uncertainty, why that's different to just risk? Well, I can. Not everybody uses jargon in the same way, but we can make decisions sometimes in a certain environment where there's nothing random or unpredictable there and then we're making decisions based on logic to get the right outcome we can make decisions sometimes under risk now if you're making a decision under risk then the outcomes of that decision all the potential outcomes of that decision you must be able to identify and you must also be able to identify meaningful probabilities for the range of outcomes which could arise if you go into a casino you're dealing with objective risk because you're dealing with objective probabilities, at least with most games in a casino, if you understand them well enough, what the probability of winning is, and generally speaking, the much higher probability of losing, you can calculate the negative expected return, and you can calculate other statistics as well. If we have a reasonable basis for estimating probabilities that might be important to us, and I talked about in the lectures about the probability of you increasing your grade, not you particularly, Christian, but students increasing their grade if they put in a number of additional hours of work on an assignment. And I said, based on your past experience and personal assessment of how difficult the assignment looks to be, what you know about yourself, then you might be able to come up with a likelihood or probability of doing that and achieving that outcome from that decision 
which there's some reasonable basis for. But I, if I set the assignment and I might have a different perspective on a particular student's work, I might have a, a very different estimate of that probability. We've both got reasonable information to go on. We're not necessarily going to agree with each other. It's subjective. We're making decisions on the basis of subjective probabilities there. When we talk about really important decisions about the world with long-term consequences, like me choosing in the late 90s to emigrate to Australia or like pairing up with someone or like setting up a small business or in a multinational corporation making a huge investment in a new geographical market, really crucial decisions like this. We as decision makers, we might think we're making decisions on the basis of subjective probability, but as Keynes explained more than a century ago, we're not really. We're making decisions under the basis of genuine uncertainty, where it's often impossible even to specify the range of possible outcomes that could arise. And even if we could specify the range of outcomes that could arise, we'd have no reasonable basis for identifying the probability of a particular investment being successful or a particular decision paying off. So this is where animal spirits comes from. Yeah. Well, even there, you talk about 90 and uncertainty. People sometimes distinguish between 90 and Keynesian uncertainty. Right, right. Frank Knight was one of the first economists to write about uncertainty in a book called, I think, Risk, Uncertainty of Profit or something like that, that was published in the early 1920s, I think in 1923. And Knightian uncertainty is the idea that the information might exist out there so that it's theoretically possible if only you could gather all the relevant information and if only you had enormous cognitive capacity, if only you were a, a very well-developed artificial intelligence engine with a limitless ability to capture and process information, maybe you could come up with a probability distribution and end up making a decision under the basis of risk. But generally speaking, ordinary human beings lack the information and don't have the cognitive capacity to do that. But Keynesian uncertainty is something more fundamental. If I was to give you an example of something which is definitely uh, relating to Keynesian uncertainty, what's the probability of the US and China going to war in the next 10 years? Not only do we not know that, but actually that information doesn't exist. Nothing like the present set of circumstances has ever happened before. There is no information to go on. There is no reasonable basis, not to sound like Donald Rumsfeld from years ago talking about known unknowns and unknown unknowns. There's no reasonable basis for anyone. Nobody knows that probability and there is no probability distribution. The information simply doesn't exist. Now, Keynes believed that where many important decisions are concerned, decisions relating to investments on the stock market, decisions relating to big corporate investments, decisions related to people setting up their own small business. Many decisions are taken on the basis of fundamental uncertainty. And with fundamental uncertainty, well, we can go to the bank manager when we're trying to take out a loan and we can estimate for the sake of the bank manager what we might pretend we think we're going to sell in the next five or 10 years and what we pretend our revenues and our costs will be. But actually, in practice, we don't really know. And it's very often impossible to know because the future is not going to be like the past. The past is not a random sample drawn from all possible futures. There is no logical basis for statistical analysis. And when it comes to making the decision, you're right, Christian, as Cain said, that decision is going to depend on animal spirits, on the degree of optimism we have. And humans tend to be very optimistic. So even though most small businesses fail, it doesn't stop people setting up small businesses. Your particular small business is not necessarily going to be the same as everybody else's. What it does mean, however, is that we have such a flimsy basis for any forecast we might be making of future events that relatively small piece of new information can undermine our confidence in anything we think we do understand about our business environment and the economy. And consequently, this was part of Keynes' story of how economic collapses can be exacerbated. And it was part of what Hyman Minsky then built into his financial instability 
hypothesis of economic uh, cycles, optimism growing and growing during periods of stability, the monetary system becoming more and more fragile as private debts grow up, as people and businesses get more and more overextended. And then perhaps a relatively minor event, it might even be a small increase in interest rates or energy prices or a relatively small event if there's not a big central bank and a big central government coming along to put a floor under the economy uh, could lead to a, a crash like 1929 or like 2008. Stability is destabilizing. Yeah, and whereas neoclassical economists after the Second World War took Keynes name in vain and the Paul Samuelsons and the Robert Solos that were about in the 50s and 60s and believed you could manage the economy with reference to the Phillips curve, of course, that everything that then broke down in the 70s, they called themselves neo-Keynesians. And then the Larry Summers and Greg Mancuse and John Taylors in the 90s and 2000s leading up to the GFC, and they're still largely in charge now. They put the emphasis more on central banks and monetary policy and less on governments trying to manage the economy actively through fiscal policy. But they called themselves new Keynesians. None of them, people like me say, understood the general theory. None of them understood Keynes' perspective on economics more generally because they never bore in to Keynesian uncertainty, to Keynes' discussion about imperfect and absent information and how people make decisions in a complex and uncertain environment that they don't fully understand and that deep down they know they don't fully understand. So just to recap there, in case I said it wrong earlier, nighty and uncertainty is the information does exist and it's out there, but we're not powerful enough as human computers to access the information. We just can't get access to it, but it exists. Whereas Keynesian uncertainty is, no, it doesn't exist. <laughs> That's why the Austrian school economists love Frank Knight. Right, got it. Because got if it. you're in the Austrian school, no individual can understand the economy well enough, for example, to identify what the price of a particular product should be or which businesses should be successful in a market and which shouldn't. But collectively, when we interact through a market, because the Austrian school, as we know, take on board some of the neoclassical nonsense, we're all acting independently and we're not influenced or manipulated by anybody else, then the market magically, through the wisdom of crowds, takes all the little bits of information that Patricia knows and Christian knows and Stephen knows and millions of other people knows and magically out comes the right price and out come the right products. And as long as the government doesn't intervene in the economy or do anything foolish like create inflation or anything like that, we'll have, of course, there'll be booms and busts, but that's part of creative destruction. It's part of a vigorous growing economy over time. That's the Austrian school for you. That nobody can understand the economy individually, but markets do a fantastic job. But there's a very flawed aspect to that theory in that wisdom of the crowds, which I can believe in, 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 in instances where the, each individual's decision is completely independent from each other, and more so that the decisions of those individuals don't impact on the outcome. In the economy, everything being interconnected, that doesn't happen, does it? Absolutely. Perhaps I didn't make myself clear enough. The Austrian school is complete cobblers. Yeah. <laughs> That's a nonsense. <laughs> um, they like to talk about uncertainty, but they're talking about night in uncertainty. It's sometimes called, I don't like to use the word because I can't really say it without stumbling, but sometimes night in uncertainty is sometimes called epistemological uncertainty. <laughs> you totally nailed it. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the information exists, but only through the magic of the marketplace can it be real? Individuals can possibly understand the world well enough, but the market can. When we talk about Keynesian uncertainty, it's not about information being costly to process or about our cognitive limitations. Although Keynes sometimes talked about Keynesian uncertainty, he had a more eclectic, he understood about the distinction between logic and risk and uncertainty as someone who was a friend of Bertrand Russell, you'd expect him to understand those things. But Keynesian uncertainty is something very different. And to go back to Gerd Gigerenza, Gerd Gigerenza is very close to Keynes, as was uh, Herbert Simon, 
another behavioral economist from years ago who also got a Nobel Prize. Actually, they're talking about how to behave like a rational human being, how to behave in a purposeful way in a complex and uncertain economy that neither you nor anybody else perfectly understands. That's what they're talking about. The most pernicious thing about neoclassic economics in this context is that neoclassical economists say you're irrational when you don't behave according to the axioms of expected utility theory. Now, first of all, there's a lot of evidence that even when it is possible, because you put people in artificial, easy to understand situations and then done experiments on them, people don't behave according to the axioms of expected utility theory. But secondly, in the real world, generally speaking, it's impossible for us to behave in that way. So we have to use heuristics, we have to use shortcuts or rules of thumb, we have to have ways of making decisions in an uncertain world. That doesn't make us irrational. Herbert Simon said it means we are using what he sometimes called procedural rationality, sometimes called bounded rationality. He called how rationality is usually defined in neoclassical economics substantive rationality, but he also said, it, in my view, quite rightly, that that's an impossibly high bar to set if you want to talk about somebody being rational or irrational, because it's actually impossible for us to behave like that. So, of course, we don't. And it's basically time travel hasn't been invented yet. <laughs> so that's the big point where our rationality must be bounded, as you say. And then you go back to your story, Gert Gugerinter's story of the professor. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't expect me to behave like it says in the textbooks. This is serious. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. And now we're talking about people as they are. I just wanted to pull out one thing from your book, from your people as they are section. People satisfice. Rather than utility maximizers, we do this thing called satisficing. What do we mean by satisficing? Well, that's good ignorance. I would say that's a heuristic that plays an important role in what he calls the adaptive toolkit that we use to make what he also calls, perhaps a little bit confusingly, ecologically rational decisions. Under different sets of circumstances, we can identify over time what's basically the most effective approach to making decisions. It never involves optimizing. It very often involves satisfying. And we do this in our lives. When you choose your partner, you don't try out everyone in the world. <laughs> I mean, some people try. It never seems to work. <laughs> Joseph Stiglitz, in part, got a Nobel Prize for economics for looking at the optimal search size decisions. And in this case, the optimal search size decisions are how many people do you go out with before you decide, well, I'll stick with this one. What's the optimal search So That's not how you do it. You might try out one or two people, but then you find someone, you never to find anyone that's perfect, none of us are perfect, but I know, this person is good for me. I, I'd like to say, in case my wife's listening, I actually did. Well, there you go. Absolutely. I'm sure she did as well. But I mean, that's how we do everything, isn't it? You don't, you're looking for a house. You want one that meets your needs. You haven't worked out rationally in advance what the search size should be before you stop searching. And you find one that's good enough for you. A car, you I'm not that I'm anyway comparing these types of decisions. It's a little bit like the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. You know, a central banker knows it when they see it. Well, they do, or, or I'll put it another way, it, it doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They can't name it. The problem with that, of course, is that that concept, so often this happens in neoclassical economics, and it's often innocent. It's not on purpose. But once you define a concept like that, very often you stop thinking about institutions to allow you to get to non-inflationary full employment. So you don't talk about a job guarantee because you talk about a Nairu. There are questions you're not allowed to ask. To go back to Hyman Minsky again, like he said, the prince is constrained by the theory of his intellectuals. What that means is that there are questions we're not allowed to ask because they don't fit in the standard theory. There's no way to ask those questions in the standard theory, so it's very difficult to ask those questions at all. It's shocking to even ask the questions. These days, it's shocking for people to ask, to say, and maybe this isn't true in every country, but in the US, could Warren be right? 
have higher interest rates boosted demand instead of restricting demand? I've mildly said that a couple of times. We were mentioning before we started on Twitter. And you get, I don't think it's bots this time, you get the most, I get people who are genuinely anguished or angry. It's rage, with me, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Including famous economists, some of whom have been friendly with me in the past. Uh, there are things you're just not allowed to say. So we have to be really careful before we let them get away with using terms like Nauru or with talking about rational expectations and people who maximize their expected utility. Such a person is never going to be misled. So we don't have to worry about misleading advertising, do we? Who would want to do misleading advertising? If you were a somebody with godlike knowledge who never made any avoidable mistakes, you'd soon see through that. And so the misleading advertising would disappear again. Of course, that's not the way the world works. It's not the way human beings work. We are easily manipulated. Marketing people have known that for a long time. Behavioral economists have talked about it at least since Kahneman and Tversky in the 1970s. And propagandists have known it since ancient Rome. But neoclassical economists, apparently not. Can I give you an example of something I encountered during the research that I was making on price determination. And obviously, I think this was talked about by John Robinson and, and other heterodox economists a, a while back. So we've known it for a while. But so the, the mainstream always talks about utility maximizing in individuals, but it talks about profit maximizing in firms. And when it talks about how firms set prices, it will refer to that profit maximizing equation as a means of saying this is how firms do this. However, in the real world, the price per item, say if a firm produces a number of goods, the costs incurred in producing those goods in themselves depend on the total sale or the total production of those goods. So the firm doesn't know the cost per unit before the sale has taken place. So that would completely make it impossible to work out any kind of profit maximizing or profit optimization equation. So I think how I understand it is that, and I think what you've been alluding to as well, is that we make decisions based on, it's just risk management, isn't it? The firm may not know exactly how much the cost of something, how to optimize their prices, but they may know how to reduce the risk of a loss in the future by looking at what's happened in the past or looking at maybe what other firms are doing and therefore taking a safe approach with maybe some risk taken there as well. But is that how you understand it? It is. And I also think you should have a good chat to Christian because I think he knows a lot about this too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because he's just studied the subject. And if I might suggest someone you might interview at some point, you might interview at some point possibly the world's best expert in post keynesian microeconomics, in my view, since the death of Fred Lee, whose name is Eric Dean, who is going to teach real-world microeconomics to Christian at some point on our course. What you are referring to there, John Robinson didn't know that initially. If you're a neoclassical economist, you might, if you've learned economics, some people did economics A-level at school decades ago, like me, and we came across John Robinson as one of the people who developed the model of monopolistic or imperfect competition which has got profit maximization and marginal revenue because marginal cost of all that stuff in it. But in the 1930s, there were some business people and some academics that set up a group called the Oxford Economist Research Group under somebody called Philip Andrews. And that group, for the first time, amazing, but what they decided to do was to talk to some business people to actually try and find out how the business people set prices. They're a novel idea, asking the people. <laughs> <laughs> well, for the first year or two, it wasn't very successful because they just talked past each other. The economists didn't understand what the business people were talking about because the business people were talking about pricing for a fixed margin over their variable costs or maybe pricing for a margin over what all their costs were based on trying to forecast a normal level of sales because you have to specify your scale in order to be able to estimate what your unit costs are, which you were saying before. It took from the beginning of the 1930s till pretty much the end of the 30s or even the early 40s 
before a realistic approach to pricing found its way into the work of people like Joan Robinson and Michel Kaleski and other post-Keynesian economists. Post-Keynesian pricing theory was then developed from their work over the subsequent decades, and it's very well described in a PhD-level post-Keynesian book, which I've made people like Christian take a look at some parts of, even though they're in a foundations course, called Post-Keynesian Economics New Foundations. There's a really good summary of it on there, and it basically says pretty much what you just said, but it goes through all the research behind it. And one of the things you'll find in that book is that and most of this uh, has actually been done by neoclassical economists, although they've just not let it affect their work afterwards. But there have been over 100 pieces of research in the subsequent, what, 80 years? Over 100 pieces of research where people have surveyed businesses of all kinds, mainly in secondary and tertiary sectors of economies, but in different economies around the world, small businesses, big businesses, and not even a single one of those pieces of research has come up with any results to justify the neoclassical approach to pricing decisions. There's one that was published in the 1990s that I'm going to forget the name of, Asking About Pricing, I think it was called. The lead author was Alan Blinder, who is a, a, a leading New Keynesian economist and earlier in his career often co-authored things with James Tobin, who was a famous old-fashioned neo-Keynesian economist. And he was co-authored by a number of other people, including Jeremy Rudd, who works at the Fed and is the person who famously referred in a Federal Reserve report a year or two ago that you probably remember to neoclassical economics as basically being a way of enforcing inequality and defending the status quo in a footnote to one of the things that he wrote. But there has never been a piece of research that has even remotely supported the way that pricing decisions are described, not only in introductory economics books in our schools and universities, but even in advanced and up to PhD level. They never get to a realistic approach to pricing by businesses that are administering prices based on constant average variable costs or marginal costs and falling average fixed costs in a world where, as Patricia just said, basically, actually, as you expand the scale of your sales, your unit costs go down. They don't go up in typical businesses as long as you haven't hit full capacity. This was explained by the post Keynesians, who also took on the neoclassical theory of the firm very effectively in the 50s and 60s in a variety of ways. For a while, neoclassical economists got defensive, but they just started talking about maximizing something else. So William Baumol started talking about businesses maximizing sales revenue because often remuneration and status of executives depending on the size of the firm rather than its profitability. There's another industrial economist called Williamson who developed a model of managerial utility maximization where you have to specify what the managers care about and they maximize that subject to making enough profits to keep the shareholders happy. But it was always about optimization. It never engaged with Keynesian uncertainty, with the fundamentals of what Keynes and then the post-Keynesian economists were discussing. And then it faded away because, as I was mentioning before, in the context of macroeconomics in the 1970s, economics went from being unrealistic to being absurdly unrealistic. <laughs> what a step, yeah. So let's just, because we've sort of danced around it a little bit here, let's just get a bit more into people as they are. And what we're describing now is that, that it's been avoided trying to understand human decision-making in neoclassical economics. And it doesn't really get addressed until the development of prospect theory, as I understand it. Tell us about what might be important to know about prospect theory and whether I've got the history right there. Well, goodness me. I don't want to go back to Daniel Bernoulli and the 18th century, so let's not go all the way back there, but it took literally centuries for utility theory and expected utility theory, the idea that we understand our preferences, we understand the world well enough, we have the information, we have the cognitive capacity, and we have the power to consistently make decisions across our lives which maximise our well-being. Now, 
the development of all that theory started probably with Daniel Bernoulli, who wrote a paper when Adam Smith was at primary school. That's how long ago. This goes back before the wealth of nations. And it was mathematical then. Mathematical economics is not a new thing. You can, and this is for Patricia and the other economics, I won't say nuts out there, the people that are obsessed with economics. If you have access to the journal Econometrica, which one or two people might do in a university library, Daniel Bernoulli's original paper was published in Econometrica. I can't remember when, I think in the late 1950s. But anyway, so that's what expected utility theory was about. Now, the final dots and full stop to it, really, in terms of its development, was by two economists called von Neumann and Morgenstern, who also invented game theory in the late 1940s. People started to test the assumptions, often called axioms, of expected utility theory in the early 1950s. And as soon as they started to test them, they found they failed. There's never been any evidence that people behave remotely the way neoclassical economists model them to behave. And Herbert Simon, by the end of the 1950s, was going back to things that Keynes had talked about and was talking about satisfying behaviour and, like I was saying before, procedural rationality and substantive rationality. So he was around long before Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky. We'll be right back after this message from our sponsor. Hey there, dear listener. Our sponsor for this episode of the MMT podcast is you, the listener, and we can't do it without you. And when I say it, I mean our aim to promote the best understanding that we can put together of how this thing called the economy actually works and how we can make it better. And we think a big part of that is knowing that better is possible and that many destructive policy choices are often sold to us by falsely equating the spending capacity of a government to that of a household. The way your government spends is nothing like the way a person or a household spends because currency issuing governments are the source of their own spending money. Unemployment, underemployment, underfunded public health services, poverty and many other things that politicians and pundits sell to us as sad but necessary are actually never necessary. Our money system has been mischaracterized in the media and academia for decades. An electorate that knows how it works can truly change things for the better and literally save lives. So we hope you can find it in your heart to support us via patreon.com slash MMT podcast because it really helps keep the show going and we want to make it bigger and better. So thanks as ever for the time you put into understanding MMT. Let's dive back in. At the end of the 1960s, Amos Tversky, who was an economist with an interest in psychology, met Daniel Kahneman, who was an academic psychologist. And over coffee one day, he told Daniel Kahneman how economists model human behaviour and the way that people develop feelings of well-being. And Daniel Kahneman literally didn't believe it. He sputtered his coffee out. He laughed. He thought it was absurd. And they got together and decided to do something about it. So in 1974, they published a famous paper which is called Heuristics and Biases paper. Don't ask me where it's published, although you can look this up, Christian, because you've got the reference from it in our course, which basically went through, talked about uncertainty and the need for heuristics to make decisions, but did so in a way which was quite polite towards neoclassical economics. But he talked about things like substitution bias. We meet that in MMT, of course, when people start talking about government finances and that seems a bit complicated, so they try to understand the result of their own finances. They've used the substitution heuristic. They've taken a complicated question, or I think it's complicated, substituted a simpler one that seems to be related to it and been misled by that. That's a heuristic which leads to a bias. And they talked about anchoring the way in which we are disproportionately influenced by extreme information, as propagandists know about, or sometimes by the first information we come across relating to a particular issue. And there are other heuristics as well. The availability heuristic. If there's been a plane crash, people don't like to fly because they find it easy to imagine that they might be in a plane crash. If something is at the front of your mind, you tend to massively overestimate the probability of it happening. That's just the way that we as human beings are. We don't seem to be able to deprogram ourselves fully from that. So they talked about that and other criticisms 
of expected utility theory. Then the neoclassical economist came back and said, well, it's all very well talking about that, but we have a sophisticated mathematical model of human behaviour. We're not going to take you seriously unless you've also got a sophisticated mathematical model of human behaviour. Either develop your own model so that you can have a model that will be our model, or shut up and go away. So Kahneman and Tversky went away, and over the next five years they developed prospect theory, which is a more general theory of decision-making, uncertainty and risk. It doesn't really deal with fundamental uncertainty than expected utility theory. And there's a huge variety of insights from it that we won't get over in a podcast. Things like mental accounting are in prospect theory. That's where people are making investment decisions, for example, on the stock market. Neoclassical finance theory says rationally you should take into account your whole investment portfolio and you shouldn't be concerned if you bought into one particular company, if it's a small part of your portfolio, and you happen to lose money on it, you need to have a broader view than that. Well, maybe people can be trained to think like that when they're professional fund managers, but most people don't feel like that. Most people look at their investments one at a time and exhibit mental accounting in all sorts of other ways. We don't think in the context of our entire life. We think about decisions one at a time. We have reference dependence, which has always been part of post-Keynesian economics, really. Now, uh, that's the idea that how happy are you this year if you've got a million dollars this year? Well, that might depend, first of all, on how much money you had last year. So our utility doesn't just depend on our wealth. It depends on comparisons we make with how wealthy we were in the past and maybe also with what we might have expected to happen. If things turn out better than we would have expected, we feel good. If things turn out worse than expected, we feel bad. Losses give us more pain than profit. So a dollar better off than you expected is nice, but a dollar worse off than you expected has a much bigger psychological impact on you. That's called loss aversion. That feeds into the endowment effect. It's why if somebody's trying to sell you a house, they'll try and make you feel that you already own it because then it's really painful if you don't get it. Reference dependence, of course, is also why we really dislike disadvantageous inequality so much. Your income might rise over time, but in a society that's becoming more and more unequal, where you see the people who you're surrounded with getting better and better off relative to you, that's a painful thing to do. That's in prospect theory. The availability bias is in prospect theory. We tend to overestimate the probability of very unlikely events if we can imagine them happening. Lots of people overestimate the probability of winning the lottery. That's in prospect theory. There are lots of things in prospect theory that you don't find in expected utility theory. And that prospect theory paper is the second most widely cited paper in the history of economic thought as a result. Daniel Kahneman won the 2002 Nobel Prize for Economics. Not that it's really a Nobel Prize, but I sort of respect him because he never studied economics, but has the Nobel Prize. Good on you, Daniel. His book, Thinking Fast and Slow, is a really interesting book to read. But he's not as close to us as Gerd Gigerens, because with Daniel Kahneman, heuristics are often the result of cognitive limitations and lead to bias. Whereas Gerd Gigerens's contribution is to say, well, you need to take prospect theory, but then you need to add to it fundamental uncertainty. We need to go back to Keynes and fundamental uncertainty. And then different types of heuristics for different sets of circumstances are often the best way of making decisions in a fundamentally uncertain environment. So Gigerenzer is one step on from Kahneman to Tversky. Kahneman to Tversky sort of built on Herbert Simon. Herbert Simon goes back to John Maynard Keynes. Uh, and John Maynard Keynes, as Paul Davidson often says, you can argue was the first behavioural economist. And getting a handle on these heuristics that come up and ideas about framing, such as loss aversion, it becomes important when you're thinking about framing policy, such as, say, the job guarantee or such as talking about degrowth. There's a way to talk about degrowth, which kind of says, no, here's what you're going to get, right? Rather than you, everybody needs to go on a diet and this is what you're going to lose. Could you talk about that? Yeah, people react more 
to losses than they do to gains relative to their reference point. So yeah, that's a very important insight. Another important insight is that people tend to be risk averse where gains are concerned, whereas they'll take a risk to avoid something that might otherwise have been a loss. And this is well understood. And you could go back to language and cognitive linguistics and George Lakoff here really and tie it all together. This is well understood and always has been by conservatives. It's not well understood on the more sort of progressive side of politics. Don't spend all your time talking about taxing people more highly because people think loss and they react strongly to that. It doesn't mean I think that people in the top 10% of the population need to be taxed much more highly, not because we need their money, as you and I know, but because we need them to have less money and less power. And it's one of the ways of helping to deliver a, a more equitable society. But stressing the positive rather than the negative, talking about government investment. There is an article that Patricia will have read that Christian of made to read, but you may well have read before, Bill Mitchell and Louisa Connors about framing and modern monetary theory that builds all this stuff into it, actually, and relates back to those sort of insights from prospect theory. Yes, and so degrowth, when people see that as a threat to their standard of living, that can have a big impact on them. Now, you might sometimes want to do that. I deliberately, I think Patricia was at this conference at the New School, the MMT conference a few years ago. I deliberately dropped that into a talk I did in a side room because at that time there wasn't much discussion of ecological sustainability still among the MMT community and I thought there ought to be, so I thought I'm going to drop a bomb. I said we might get to the point where you just won't be able to grow the US economy anymore because of the ecological impact of doing that and because we need to make more room within our planetary boundaries for countries in the global south. Or you will be able to grow the US economy, but that very growth will destroy the capacity for it to grow further. <laughs> and then you won't be able to grow it after that. Exactly. You know, which, which it's sort of appealing to a different part of the brain if you say it in that way, isn't it? So I don't say, don't use the word degrowth. But you use different language for different audiences. Yeah, yeah. It's all about context. You can't, of course, you can't separate the audiences out from each other. And the people that use the word degrowth the most are young activists. And who am I to tell them what words to use? You can separate the audiences out from each other, though. That's what's different about the internet. People keep treating the internet and social media and, and what have you as like it's television, like people sit down to watch it and a million people all watch the same thing and they don't, they find what they like and they go in. So it is possible to make bespoke messages. And in fact, that is what say the Trump campaign did. They were making ads that would only hit like very small numbers of people, but tons of different ads, as I understand it. I think activists need to find their own in little niches of audiences, right? and develop their own language in a way. Well, yeah, you know, we can't tell people what to say. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah that, which is a very valid point. But I bring this up because I think there's a thirst for creating one-size-fits-all messages regarding, say, modern money theory. And when people online will get very irate if you don't say it in exactly the way that they like to hear it said. And it's like, yeah, I, we both agree. Generally, you could say, look, we definitely both agree on the theory and our axiomatic principles. And I'm just saying it in this way because I'm talking to this group of people. I'm aiming at this group of people. Unfortunately, you weren't the intended audience for that comment. Or otherwise, I would have said it in a different way, in a way that would please you. And I, I will do. And I have said it in your preferred way in the past. So neither way is wrong. And you know, I think we need it all. You're both great communicators, Christian. If you come up against that, and I do sometimes as well, then, and I am talking as an old man who sometimes gets grumpy, but I, I just want to say, if anyone out there who fits this description happens to be listening, I love you. But in MMT, <laughs> we have more than our fair share of grumpy old men. <laughs> and where I sometimes make people more grumpy by saying, well, I think you could just be a bit more polite. It's because it's not the people that we're talking to I'm worried about often. It's the third parties 
it's other people. Uh, and that's where I wish people were a bit less grumpy and a bit more. So, yeah, some people like talking about government debt as the net money supply. Uh, others don't. I mean, technically, if by money supply you mean official monetary aggregates, it's not a correct way of defining net government debt, but it's pretty clear what it means. And actually, I think that term might originally have been used by David Arnold Farto, a government debt who's not even an MMT economist at all. By the way, he's in the new movie, Finding the Money. But technically, yes, technically, we should talk about the net financial assets of the non-government sector. But for some people, that's a rather long and they sort of fall asleep while you get to the end of that talk. So <laughs> that's just a tweet yeah. on its own, isn't it? Yeah, you're running out of words when you say <laughs> that. The, the point that I hope to get over in this podcast, amongst other things, because I've been waffling on about all sorts of stuff, is not only are there problems with neoclassical economics, but the great thing is, and MMT isn't the whole of the story. It's not even most of the story. It's, I hope that doesn't shock people. But it's a large chunk. It's a vital part of it, just like if you're driving a car, you need all the parts in the engine. MMT is a vital part. It's not just that there are things wrong with neoclassical economics. We have now a complete, an entirely complete alternative framework for thinking about economics. And I don't think until MMT came along that we could have said that. We have, they've got their general equilibrium models. We've got our godly Le Lavoir. Sectoral. Well, Lavoir doesn't describe them. Yes. It? Yeah, we've got our central balance models and the more sophisticated of those, well, yes, they show how the various bits fit together and you can put a supply side in and that supply side has post-Keynesian pricing theory and uncertainty built into it because Wim Godley, who was the driving force behind this, was a very brilliant, a very brilliant economist and way ahead of his time, really, because there was a textbook which much of this published in 1983, which nobody bought at the time, but we have the whole thing. We can have our own, if only people would demand it, our own university departments with our own heterodox departments dominated by, as far as the macro side is concerned, should be modern people who would be happy to call themselves modern monetary theory economists. But we have a complete approach to microeconomics, which is realistic, which has Human beings, as they actually behave, is heavily influenced by psychology and neuroscience, which has businesses as they actually behave and is influenced by organizational theory, but also the way businesses set prices, the way we describe it should be pretty much the same way management accountants do, because we want to be realistic. But there's nothing that the neoclassicals have that we don't have, and the only bit that they have, that well, we want to really, is, again, Patricia was mentioning this earlier, yes, the econometrics is important. That has a power in our approach. That's what we need. And in the UK, you need a big, preferably prestigious university that ambitious kids will want to go to, which offers a realistic 21st century approach to doing economics and this neoclassical stuff we should teach as part of the history of economic thought or for the purpose of making comparisons, but it's well past time in 2023 when it should be privileged and we should not be forcing young people to do neoclassical PhDs and have a dreadful time of it anymore, which is what a lot of people who want to do economics as a profession are still being forced to do. Cannot miss people actually down the years, I've had to say, play the game and get your doctorate, publish a paper or two, get a job and then change your mind when you're in a uni. We shouldn't be doing that anymore. It's so difficult to make these changes. And in the UK, it's got nowhere so far, really. Yeah, yeah. Well, if we needed Stephen Hale here, you shouldn't have left. <laughs> yeah, it's all your fault, Stephen. <laughs> I'm really. an entity. You need a <laughs> staff from Kempton or a Bill Mitchell or a Randall Ray, that, that's what you need. Or a John Harvey, for that matter. It's all in Phil's hands now. No, no, no. I think you're the one in the engine room, mate. John Harvey loves England and Hart and Ireland. You should <laughs> oh, get into yeah. it immigrate. Yeah. So I'm hoping you've got time for this, Stephen, because I really wanted to turn the corner because you've touched on MMT and talk about something for the money nuts and bolts people out there injecting a bit of MMT. As an illustration of what can happen policy-wise when you get the money story wrong, 
here in the UK, our Green Party really mean well. I'd want to see them do well. If you read their policy positions on their website, it is clear that they know there's something wrong with how we run the monetary system. So we're in agreement. But I'd say they've come up with the wrong diagnosis. So if you read their website, they want to get rid of the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee, which is nine unelected people who set interest rates every six weeks over here. So it's not a bad idea to get rid of those guys. But they want to replace that committee with another unelected committee who will decide the quantity of money that the government can issue. So this is like a very old idea. And and they've called that the National Monetary Authority. That's their idea. And just to quote from the website, the National Monetary Authority will be mandated by law to manage the stock of national currency so it is sufficient to support full employment while avoiding general inflation in prices. So it's good to see that you know, they've got full employment and price stability on the menu like we have. But I'd say the stock of currency line is quite telling. But anyway. Blame me. It's probably my fault. I did a talk in 2018 when I was severely jet lagged in Oxford <laughs> right. with Maurice Scott Cato. I've got the patient zero in the interview. <laughs> I didn't do a good enough job. Actually, the chair of that meeting was Larry Sanders, Bernie's brother. I remember when you came over. It was great to see you. Yes, but I probably didn't do the talk very well that evening because Molly obviously didn't take it in. But I would just to say the problem that we've got with this is, if, well, there's quite a few, but stock of currency, it's the flow that determines what happens in the economy, not the stock, for instance. You know, and I don't think that's a trivial sort of nitpicky point that they're not really understanding that. They have to go all the way back to Randy Ray's history of money lecture that we had the other day. Because getting money wrong is largely, I think, a function of not understanding what money is. And not understanding what money is, is related to not understanding how money emerged in the first place. So I think you end up going all the way back to Keynes' Babylonian madness and uh, David Graeber's debt the first 5,000 years, which a few of them surely have read. And they don't know what money is. Is And they often, at the same time that as a sovereign money, they're probably talking about banning banks from creating money. Yes, they are. Yeah, cannot ban the private creation of money unless you ban debt itself. And debt is something which it is simply impossible to ban. Yeah, because since debt is literally somebody saying, I owe you one. <laughs> right? You know, it's a promise to do something. That's right. And if you sign that, Christian... And if you are very famous in the community, as a famous comedian, that everybody trusts your word, because it's well known that you can trust comedians' word at all times, <laughs> and then your IOUs might start circulating in the community and you've created money. If you want to have public control over money creation, you really need to nationalise the banking system. And I'm not sure that's a good idea because I'm not sure that public servants would make better decisions on credit creation on dealing with small businesses, etc. I think we'd all agree having a strong public bank out there as a sort of benchmark is a really good idea, I think. Absolutely. There should be a public option. And indeed, you're getting into sort of Roman Gray area. We're not far away from a time where potentially everybody could have the right to have a an account at the central bank. There's no particular reason why they couldn't do that now. Christian and Patricia, why can't you bank directly at the Bank of England? It's not impossible. The technology exists to make that possible. Well, there is a proposal for digital money here in the Bank of England, but everybody took it as the government wants to control how much money we have in the bank. Yeah, of course, that's something slightly different. Because that's basically <laughs> like a digital form of physical currency is supposed to be yeah. anyway. But you could have... Transaction accounts as well at the central bank, which many people, maybe most people would take up. And then you move to a sort of Hyman Minsky relationship between the central bank and the private banks, because the private banks then become dependent for a large part of their funding on the central bank, because the central bank has swallowed up their deposits, which gives the central bank a closer relationship and more oversight of the types of loans that the private banks make and also. Potentially, they might use more macro potential regulation to limit the volume of loans that private banks make. But if you were to try to say that private banks can't create deposits with themselves by lending, you're basically saying they can't create IOUs for themselves. That's not going to work. They'll find ways around any such regulation 
there'll be some form of disintermediation which will get around it over time. And the people that propose that, they're well-meaning. They have in the past been famous economists, even at one stage Milton Friedman. But like Milton Friedman, they don't understand what money is or how banking works. Yeah, that's really what I wanted to get to, that if you've got a committee voting on the quantity of money, we're back to the quantity theory of money. What's going to happen is, well, the circumstances that quantity of money fosters is the thing that floats, right? So, well, we voted on the quantity of money. That's all the money there is. So, well, yeah, if there's unemployment or a recession or all kinds of disasters, well, we fixed the quantity of money. There is no more money. And whereas we say... You want to fix on an outcome, and obviously the way we do it at the moment, the government fixes on the price of money, the interest rate, and then lets the circumstances float. And that's what they don't like. And I think that's a bad way to do it as well. I think we would rather fix on full employment, i.e. the job guarantee, and then let the whatever bank reserves need to be to make that happen minute to minute. That's the thing that floats. Absolutely. Yeah, technically you can limit government money. That's what the Federal Reserve tried to do in 1980. And then they had chaotically volatile interest rates for a while before they realized they didn't know what they were doing. They had to give up on doing that. I think the Chinese central bank tried to do it for about five minutes in 2013 with the same effect. Interest rates became very chaotic. Either you have an immediate financial crisis or you stop trying to do it. It used to be called monetary base control. But that's not the same thing as controlling in inverted commas, the money supply. What they don't understand is that there is no well-defined thing called the money supply. You can define certain aggregates and measure those aggregates and arbitrarily include some things in those aggregates and exclude others. Which is what they do on their website and their policy positions. I'm just going to pull a line out here, and this is a common one that comes up all the time, and I, I think we should address it. The Green Party believes that as a means of exchanging goods and services, the stock of money is a vital common resource which should be managed in the public interest. That's not a bad statement apart from, I would say, flow instead of stock. And if you're going to say stock, it ought to be the stock of non-government net financial assets, which actually means something. Money does not mean anything. That word does not have a precise meaning. And so that statement on their behalf is essentially a meaningless statement. But, I mean, positive money, as far as I know, they consider net financial assets to be relevant. Yeah, now you're talking about positive money, though, P, and that is, we're talking about the Green Party. Now, it seems to me they've been influenced by... Positive money policy. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, they go on to say this thing that comes up all the time. Yeah, only 3% of our money supply currently exists in the form of notes and coins issued by the government or the Bank of England. 97% of the money circulated in the economy takes the form of credit that is created electronically by private banks through the accounting processes they follow when they make loans. That's not strictly right. Exactly. I don't think they consider bonds in that calculation either. Right. True. First of all, to shock them even more with... The technological change over time should reduce that 3% figure. The more that we transition to all transactions being a real-time gross settlement rather than some form of deferred net settlement, the fewer the reserves the private banks will need at the central bank. And that would depress that figure. And of course, if we also transition away from using physical currency even further than we have already then maybe there won't be any physical currency. So unless you then introduce a central bank, as Patricia was just saying, digital currency, that 3% could become almost zero, but it really wouldn't matter. The other 97% has not all been created by bank lending. They don't understand. Some of that 97%, and in the UK, quite a lot, because of who treasury bonds tend to be, held by, quite a lot of treasury bonds are held by the private banks themselves. Now, when the government, when the central government spends pounds in the UK, although institutionally it's a little bit more complicated now than it used to be, but still effectively the same thing, basically what they're doing is they're putting pounds into people's bank accounts. They are adding to the deposit liabilities of the private banks. Of course, the banks on the asset side of their balance sheet, they get reserves, at the Bank of England to balance it out, but they're spending those pounds into deposits. Now, some of those pounds are then tax away. What's left over 
is the deficit. But as far as the deficit is concerned, when the government auctions treasury securities, if those treasury securities are bought by non-banks, insurance companies and the like, then of course they pay for those bonds using funds in their bank accounts and so the bank accounts go back down again. But when those treasury bonds are purchased by the banks themselves, the bank's reserves go down, the banks hold treasury bonds instead of reserves, but the deposits stay on the other side of the private bank's balance sheet. So the point I'm making is that quite a lot, I could tell you what proportion, maybe half even, of the deposit of the 97% that these people talk about was not lent into existence by the private banks. It was spent into existence by Her Majesty's government engaging in the past in deficit spending. They don't understand that. Anyone who doesn't understand that, there's no reason people shouldn't be ashamed of it, but it does mean they're perhaps not in a position to be suggesting major reforms to how the monetary system works because they don't understand how it works at the moment. Mm. And this 97, 3% thing, it's like saying 97% of people in vehicles are passengers and only 3% are drivers. And that's why the road system doesn't work. And the reason we have crashes and traffic jams is that the driver to passenger ratio is wrong. If we had 100% driver to vehicle ratio, full reserve motoring, sound driving. It's utterly irrelevant. This is what I'm trying to say. If you focus on an aggregate that's got nothing to do with the problem, you're going to come up with a non-solution. Absolutely. The point is that 97% is irrelevant. The problem is they think it's all been lent into being by the private banks. It hasn't. Yeah. It's just wrong. That's the point I'm making. But also I like to say commercial banks because in the money creation department, they are adjuncts of government. You don't get to just start a business and call it a bank and start typing money into the money supply or what we're casually calling the money supply. You're sort of deputized by the government to do that. It's a franchise system, as Bob Hockett explained in a very good paper he wrote with someone else in the Cornell Law Review a year or two ago, which we make our students read. Uh, that beautiful paper, it explains very clearly how modern monetary systems work and if there's anybody with any influence in the Green Party of England and Wales listening, that paper, Pocket and Omarova, it's by, and it's something like banking as a public franchise. It is called the finance franchise, isn't it? That's right. That explains it all. It's a very long paper, but it explains it all very clearly. But I think even before reading that, in our summer series, we had Randy Ray do his talk updated talk on the history of money a couple of days ago and it's so clear and as i said on i think on twitter or somewhere if anybody out there thinks that money emerged from barter and that money is a commodity and then that money started with the development of coinage and money was created originally in the private sector and we can run out of money if you're the currency issue in government, like the UK government, those kind of issues, if people think of any of those things are, are true, then I think they should listen to Randy. He's very entertaining in that talk, and that gets them part of the way. And then if they've never read David Graeber's Debt the First 5,000 Years, that's a good read. And if you really want to understand in detail how actual monetary systems work and how private banks and the public bank interact and where regulation is important and the way in which private sector banking or commercial banking is effectively a franchise of the government saying that these institutions do a better job deciding who to lend to than we would. We're better off regulating them and letting them do it than having some public servants make all these decisions. You might not agree with that, but that's basically how we got to the system that we have now, then do those things and you'll understand the system really well. You'll understand the government already has all of the ability to fund its spending that it needs in the UK or anywhere else with a similar monetary system. You don't need to ban private money creation by commercial banks. If you tried to ban it, there would be rays around it anyway. 
you would just lead to the development of all sorts of unregulated or quasi monies. You wouldn't achieve what you're trying to achieve. Meantime, you do a lot of damage and it would be a very unwise thing to do. Would you create a sort of black market for credit? Is that what you're implying, Stephen? Well, if there was a shortage of money, that could be dealt with. Unless you're going to ban people from issuing IOUs, there will be institutions in the community without the convenience of central bank clearing, perhaps, without a government guarantee behind them if they fail to make good on their promises. Just think cryptocurrencies are currencies, but they do show how assets of a kind can be developed. And if Apple or some other huge organization starts to issue Apple IOUs, then why shouldn't we all start spending them? Yeah. And that makes me think about the wildcat era in the US. And the problem then is that, you know, an Apple dollar and a Google dollar don't clear at par. Yeah. Oh, and it's not, it wouldn't be a good thing, but it's the sort of thing which that kind of measure would trigger. And the people coming up with that kind of measure, they're highly intelligent people. There are many things in life that they know vastly more about than I do. I'm not trying to talk down to anyone or anything. Who am I to do that? But I did used to train central bankers. So I must know something. And, and I don't think that's a good idea. Yeah, no, it's a bit complicated. <laughs> it's more complicated than it's made out to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I had a question regarding the previous topic. On the subject of trying to get a more realistic kind of understanding of how people approach decision making, and you talked about risk taking and some of the attitudes that people take on, some of the characteristics of people when they're making decisions and taking into account risks. I never see it discussed openly, but I was wondering what your thoughts were on incorporating something like Maslow's hierarchy of needs into that prioritizing and decision-making process. Christian ought to be able to answer that question if he's followed all the lectures in Fundamentals for a Little. I never see it mentioned on papers. Mark Tupfar, in his chapter, I think it was chapter two of New Post-Keynesian Foundations, when just talking about post-Keynesian theory of choice, refers to a principle of separation of needs and hierarchy of needs and does that with reference to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which of course people wouldn't have come across. We meet our lower level needs first for nutrition and safety and security and then love and belonging and self-esteem and self-actualization come later. But they discuss it in quite a in a sophisticated way. Although those needs are separable they're also satiable, the different levels of needs. There's often non satiation as an assumption in neoclassical economics models. And what you get from a proper understanding of human needs is that actually, why do businesses have to spend so much money marketing stuff to us? Because actually, our genuine needs are satiable. We don't need to limit this amount of stuff. We have to be persuaded very often to buy more and more stuff. Needs have to be created. So he discusses these principles, the principle of the creation of needs, uh, satiation of needs, separation of needs, and also the notion that one product can be meeting needs, and often it generally is, at different levels. So if you're looking at a car, you want it to be safe, and you want to feel secure, and it's also perhaps nourishing your self-esteem and all that too. But yes, that is built into a broadly post-Keynesian discussion of decision making and consumer choice and you will find it discussed in I think a fair amount of detail in chapter two of Mark Lavoie's excellent book. And that's another one of these things that really distinguishes heterodox from orthodox economics isn't it that orthodox is saying unlimited wants in a world of limited resources and how do we allocate them whereas heterodoxy is saying no 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 the wants do have a limit <laughs> actually it turns out <laughs> It's weird, actually, because in classical economics, we have the principle of diminishing marginal utility. But then when you sort of go on to macro models, you have the assumption of non satiation And on the face of it, they contradict each other. But nobody seems to say anything about that. But yes, I strongly recommend. And if you are a PhD student in economics, as one or two people around the place might be, then Mark Lavoie's book. I'm not a fan of the last few chapters because 
I'm not myself a fan of growth theory anymore for reasons that I think we have to move past an obsession with economic growth. But two thirds of that book is amongst my favorite books. And I can't use too much of it on our course because quite a lot of it is a bit too mathematical, pitched a bit too high for us. But for a PhD student, one team, an antidote for some things and grounding in a high level heterodox economics course. The book is great. And of course, Mark also co-wrote the great monetary economics stock flow consistent book with Wynn Godley. But I think, even though he's not in MMT, for me, he's one of the greatest economic theoreticians alive today. I strongly recommend that book. Great stuff, great stuff. So before we wrap up, we should say that listeners can learn all about these things we've been talking about and all the other things we talk about on this show at Modern Money Lab, where Stephen, you and your fantastic team are delivering everything from short standalone courses to a full master's degree. It's all available to anyone anywhere online. Amazing subjects, amazing teachers. Tell us about Modern Money Lab. Well, we have something of the who's who in MMT teaching for us in that we've got Scott Fulwad and John Harvey and Dirk Entz and Eric Dean and my friend and colleague over here, David Joy. People have to put up with me a little bit as well. But we've also got terrific ecological economists, one of whom you've met, Christian Colin Schneider. And Rigo Melga is a, a young guy from Guatemala who works at the University of Vermont. He's teaching ecological economics with us. And Phil Lorne does some lectures for us as well. My friend, who Patricia's met. And Annie Bond, another ecological economist, who just by chance happens to be our organiser and CEO, Gabrielle Bond's sister. But she was an ecological economist at our government research agency, the CSIRO, before we joined her. Yeah, we have pre-recorded lectures, but we have live webinars, which we run twice so that people in all the time zones can come. We found a university, one of the 40 unis in Australia that was prepared to partner with us. It was really difficult to do that. It took a long time to do. We've had tremendous support from Stephanie Kelton and Fadel Kaboom, who are adjunct lecturers, but also Warren Mosler is one of our sponsors. People like Randy Ray have helped us out. I did a talk for us the other day as well. We had students from Auckland in New Zealand to Hawaii and all sorts of places in between. Many of them start off doing one subject at a time and the graduate certificate, which is four subjects. But so far, hardly anybody has chosen to leave us at that point. People get addicted and they want to do the whole master's degree. And that's what we want to do. We want to flood the world. Not just that it's great to have the young people on the course, but any age, including retirees, We want to flood the world with people who've done a heterodox master's degree. If you do the graduate certificate, you'll be able to have an argument with any neoclassical economist up to and including Paul Krugman with confidence because you'll have a really strong base because we go into a lot of depth. And you do the whole master's degree, then it is increasingly the case that there are jobs for heterodox economists and ecological economists and people with an NNT background out there. Not so many in universities yet, unfortunately, but elsewhere. And the charity and the course I see in a way as my life's work. I've got to be nearly 60. I am 61 now. And I wanted to do something because a big problem that we have is there aren't enough courses like this and there are not enough people that have trained in these areas. And there's so much that's worth knowing. It's such a rich scene. And I don't think we'll change the world unless we've got lots of people who know this stuff. And, you know, I, I'm not a Bill Mitchell or a Stephanie Kelton. I'm not going to do the world's greatest blog or write the world's most effective book communicating MMT. But I'm not a bad teacher. So this is my attempt to do something worthwhile and leave something behind me. And I would love it if anybody listening would come and join us. And I will bend over backwards as we do for all our students, if you do, to give you the best possible experience. You'll meet some amazing people some of whom Christian has met already. You're a wonderful teacher, Stephen. We've learned so much from you over the years. Yeah, and if this is your life's project, you're succeeding in spades, absolutely. Well, that's very kind. And of course, we are touring the great movie, Finding the Money, with pretty much all those people in it, around Australia in March. That's what we're spending a lot of our time doing at the moment. It is being shown in the UK soon, including at the Scottonomics Conference, but I know one or two other places 
when you get the opportunity to see this movie, it is amazingly effective. It is a superb piece of work. So I strongly urge people to track it down. I guess at some point in time it'll be streaming, but not immediately. If it went viral, the movie itself has the potential to shift the narrative in places like the UK and Australia. And that's why we're going to be throwing the kitchen sink at it. Yeah, and the tour that you've organised of the Finding the Money film, that which features Stephanie Kelton, and it's made by our friend Marin Poitras, Marin and Stephanie will be at those screenings that you've put together, right? Absolutely. Stephanie is coming over for about 10 days. And we are going to do in that 10 day period, Adelaide, Melbourne, Brisbane, somewhere called Bungalow, where there's a film festival, Canberra and Sydney. So we've got lots of showings lined up. We have spent money we don't really have, booking cinemas all over the place. You've created private debt. That's it. Our students have actually done most of the sort of design work. So whenever you see a poster that's been amended, because it's Moran's poster originally with uh, Parliament House in Australia, if you see that online, if you see adverts with Stephanie's picture on and Sydney, Melbourne, Canberra, anything else, our students have done that. We've not spent any money on that. The support of people has been amazing. I hope it's going to be great. I felt last time she was here in January 2020, just before the pandemic, we got her on TV, in all the newspapers, on the radio. There are four MMT Beatles, I always say, Warren Mosler, Bill Mitchell, Randall Ray and Stephanie Kelton. They all have different roles, but the great communicator. If I could persuade her to come and live in Australia, sometimes I could change the country. Stephanie is a fantastic communicator. And Maren is a fantastic movie maker. Randy's in it, Fredell's in it, various others, Matt Forstad is in it. Marin has a really solid grasp of MMT as well, if you talk to her, which is great. She does, and she's going to be on the stage. We're going to have Q&A sessions afterwards. We are inviting every politician in the country, all sorts of other people. Some of them are going to come, and who knows? Who knows what we'll be able to achieve as a result? I am not interested in playing a game. I don't want to do these podcasts. I don't want to run these courses. I don't want to write stuff on the internet, articles, etc. If I'm going to be dead in 20, 30 years' time or we haven't achieved anything. I only want to do this if we're going to change the world. Persist until something happens. Yeah, absolutely. But all guns blazing. There's no question of doing this half-hearted. I'm not a prominent economist anyway, but I don't have any personal ambitions for anything. I just want us to have governments that stop with the austerity, with the obsession, with budget surpluses, with this idea that if inflation picks up without even thinking about it, you jack interest rates up. And with all the stuff that goes along with it as well that we won't go into now, if we're going to change the world, point of the course is that MMT on its own is not enough, but it's essential. That's what we want to do. And Somewhere in the movie, Stephanie says, are we going to win? I don't know, but it's going to be a hell of a fight. And that's what I see happening in the next year or two. We're going to have a hell of a fight and we're going to try and shift the narrative in Australia. I'm very much hope in the UK as well. And if I could just inject a quote that I got from your website, actually, but it's a great one from Harjun Chang. Like it or not, economics has become the language of power. You cannot change the world without understanding it. And that's the point. Absolutely. And you'll find something similar to that in chapter 24, the last chapter of Keynes' general theory. It was true in 1936 and it's true now. We don't have to always lose. We can win. We can overthrow the economics profession or at least change it and shift it. Um, That's got to be the end. Great stuff. That's a great place to leave it. We've been speaking to Professor Stephen Hale. I'll link to where you can find out more about Modern Money Lab and the Finding the Money tour in the show notes for this episode. For those of us in other parts of the world, some more dates for your diaries. Two events in the UK in March. There's the Scottonomics Festival, which takes place in Dundee. The sessions will be streamed live so you can attend from the comfort of your own home. But there's also a screening of Finding the Money, as Stephen said, at the festival. And I'm pretty sure that won't be streamed live. So get yourself an in-person ticket and I'll see you there. Also in the UK, in July, in Leeds, the Gower Initiative for Modern Money Studies 
are hosting the first UK Modern Monetary Theory Conference, which we're really excited about. It's still in the planning stage, but it takes place from the 15th to the 17th of July. Warren Mosler will definitely be there, so save those dates. Moving to Europe, the Lipinski Foundation's highly recommended MMT summer school in Poznan, Poland, runs from August the 27th to the 29th. And then directly after that in Berlin, the fourth international European MMT conference runs from the 31st of August to the 1st of September with a possibility of extra dates either side of those dates. So lots to look forward to there. I'll link to the websites and the mailing lists to subscribe to for updates. Finally, as ever for our Patreon subscribers, there's a link to all of our patron-only episodes. Lots of extras there for people to unlock. So check out the show notes for all of the above. But for now, thanks so much for joining us today on the MMT Podcast, Professor Stephen Hale. Thanks for having me. That was the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Don't forget, you can support the show through Patreon, starting at a dollar a month and get access to patron-only episodes. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. You can also find me on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can find Patricia on Twitter at Patricia N. Pino. And you can email us at MMT Podcast at Outlook.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope to hear from you.